This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Welcome back to the Beyond the Big Screen Podcast. I am very happy to be joined today by Jeffrey Orens, author of the book, The Soul of Genius, Marie Curie, Albert Einstein, and the Meeting That Changed the Course of Science. Jeffrey is a former chemical engineer and executive with the Salve Corporation, and he's the author of a number of historical articles. Jeffrey, can you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in history in general, and then this specific subject that we'll be talking about today? Absolutely. Uh, Steve, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm a uh, a 40-year veteran of the chemical industry, um, spending my last number of years before I retired with uh, Salve Chemical and um, running businesses around the world, um, traveling quite a bit. And as I traveled, uh, carrying a a book or a a tablet to read uh, as I went along and and uh, certainly with uh, interest in history from really uh, an early age. Doris Kearns Goodwin was a favorite of mine, still is, um, related to her uh, biographies um, of people like Lincoln in a team of rivals and uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft in the, the Bully Pulpit just fascinating books about historical characters that um, really changed our lives. You know, as I took a look at what was uh, going on in the the company that I was with um, before I retired Salve, um, I I really got interested in Salve and uh, and his mission. The individual Ernest Salve uh, was a a fellow who um, basically set up these conferences that uh, bear his name. And um, this initial one is of special interest related to uh, the meeting of uh, Marie Curie and Albert Einstein at that conference. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the Salve conferences and Ernest Salve, what is maybe his motivations? Because these are, you know, I think you, well, you know, when I think about conferences that I've gone to, they're, you know, they're sometimes dry affairs, but this was magnetic, this conference, and it was in many ways explosive. It was not your run-of-the-mill academic conference. Maybe t- tell us, like um, like I was saying, why Ernest Salve set these up and why were they so, I mean, these conferences were really setting up, these people were trying to understand and they debated how the uni- universe fundamentally works. Yes, um, certainly. Well, er- Ernest Salve was uh, an interesting individual. He um, was an industrial entrepreneur who came up with a better way to make a material that was very much needed in the chemical industry um, for use in a variety of, of end uses. He, he developed a, a less expensive, less polluting way to make a material called sodium carbonate. It was referred to as soda ash or just plain soda. Um, The idea of uh, taking a simple chemical um, uh, process and turning it into an industrial process that could make uh, thousands and thousands of pounds of this material was very important in the mid to late 1800s because sodium carbonate was used in a variety of uh, applications uh, for uh, glass making, for soap manufacture, in textiles and paper. And it was an additive that allowed uh, easier processing, lower costs uh, and better performance of other materials being used uh, in those processes. And so uh, this particular uh, avenue that he took made him a, a fortune, um, basically a multimillionaire over the course of a number of years. And it allowed him to then move on beyond his industrial success. He turned over the reins of his business to his family and fa- specific fa- uh, family members. And he moved on to his true passion, which was science. He was not a university trained scientist. Uh, He didn't have the chance to go to uh, uh, college because of uh, illness, 
but he had always harbored a passion for chemistry, for physics, for uh, biology. And he was searching uh, for really a set of universal laws that would bind all of these disciplines together. He never found that, but in fact, what he did find was a way to sponsor others to come together um, to discuss uh, the pressing scientific problems of the day. Um, in the early 1900s, he basically worked with uh, another uh, physicist named uh, Walter Nernst, a German who was trying to understand more about quantum theory. And Nernst had proposed to Salve that Salve sponsor a conference of elite scientists, the cream of the crop, uh, a, a very small group, 24 people, to get together to discuss uh, quantum mechanics and quantum theory as it opposed uh, classical Newtonian physics. And this was a, a, just an earth shattering uh, situation here where quantum physics was starting to supplant classic Newtonian thought related to the universe and how it worked. And Salve was more than anxious to start uh, this, this conference. He brought together these 24 individuals and um, on an all expense paid week in uh, Brussels uh, at a, a hotel, the Hotel Metropole, they engaged in fascinating discussion related to quantum theory. Um, the major difference of this conference versus any other um, was that conferences before uh, Salve put this uh, particular one together, they were more formal, very largely attended um, uh, get togethers, uh, gatherings of hundreds of individuals. Um, in fact, the first international conference on physics had almost a thousand individuals who attended that conference. So you can imagine in this size conference that there wasn't really a lot of time for anything but presentation of, uh, of uh, papers on different aspects of physics uh, at that conference. And that type of formality was something that basically Nernst and, and Salve wanted to do away with. They wanted an intimate setting 24 people getting together for discussion, for meals, for uh, getting to know each other as individuals, as well as getting to know uh, the thoughts that each had related to the pressing physics problems of the day. So this type of conference in 1911, this was the first of what turned out to be sort of a triennial cycle on almost an every three year basis with the exceptions of during World War I and World War II, Salve uh, the company and Salve the institutes that uh, Ernest Salve founded in both physics and chemistry, they sponsored these conferences, bringing together elite scientists to solve the most pressing problems, or at least to discuss and debate how to solve these problems of understanding of the world in all its scientific complexity. I find it really interesting. These, this group of scientists and this group of scientists that were working in the early 20th, the very early 20th century, to me, uh, I wasn't a big follower of sports in high school, but when you read the list of these names, it was like all my idols were at this conference. Why at this particular time, what was going on that made physics have such a, for the, you know, the lack of a better word, a quantum leap? And knowledge. It seems like at this time period, so much changed. What, what were maybe the the things that happened in proceeding that allowed this to happen? Well, it's a it's a good point you bring up. Um, until the end of the nineteenth century, beginning of the twentieth, concepts of physics were ingrained in most physicists around the world. Um, these concepts were Newtonian um, physics concepts. Isaac Newton had 250 years earlier come up with um, the concept of gravity. 
and laws of motion and understanding the nature of light as a form of energy. And his genius in terms of understanding all of these things and putting them in a, a context that explained how the larger world and the universe actually worked was something that became ingrained in physicists and in general understanding of how um, large bodies in space related to each other, the planets, the stars, um, how the moon and the earth interacted. And all of those types of things were very much over the course of a couple hundred years ingrained in scientific thought. And towards the end of the uh, end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, what started to happen was that there was more experimentation, not on this huge macro level of planets interacting and those types of things, but really a focus in the other direction towards the minuscule atomic universe and the subatomic universe. And in the mid 1890s, um, Wilhelm Rankin discovered X-rays, um, a form of electromagnetic energy that was unheard of uh, and, and was beneficial to uh, society. Uh, a stream of uh, uh, electromagnetic energy could be shot at someone's uh, body and you could see um, the bones within the body. Uh, just a, a fascinating type of concept. At the same time, Henri Becquerel was discovering that uranium gave off uh, unusual emissions that um, he couldn't quite categorize, but um, explained to the French Academy of Sciences were something that needed more exploration. And Marie Curie and her husband, Pierre, actually did that. And they explored uranium uh, emissions and um, actually went further to explore uh, some minerals, so one of which pitch blend um, contained uranium to find that the residues in pitch blend after uranium was removed, these residues actually gave off more of these strange emissions than uranium itself. And they were working down the path to, uh, to discover radioactivity and uh, two new elements, uh, polonium and, uh, and radium. So here was now a couple, Marie and Pierre Curie, who were finding out things about the subatomic universe, how, how atoms actually decayed in this situation and were transformed into other materials, um, something that was unheard of and uh, just fascinating. So more scientists were looking into the subatomic universe, Max Planck, then Einstein, spending time on understanding how light could behave as both a wave, which was the classical thought of light as a wave of energy, and how it could also behave as discrete particles of energy called quanta. And that basically um, started scientists thinking about uh, quantum uh, theory and mechanics and started them to understand that classical physics could be viewed differently from a subatomic uh, standpoint rather than taking a look at the macro universe as Newton had. So that view of, of energy, of subatomic particles, the electron was discovered in that time period, and then uh, an understanding of the atom with a nucleus and a cloud of electrons surrounding it. Those types of things were all new and uh, bringing to uh, the science of physics a completely different way of looking at, at the universe. And it had to be reconciled in some manner because Newtonian physics looked at science in a, in a classical way. Here, the new quantum theories were things that had to be explored and understood better. And that's just what Einstein and others did. 
I think one of the, the maybe the things that I find so fascinating about this time is that so many of the things that these, and I, I think this will lead us into a, a further part of the conversation of talking about the people who are, they're the most interesting part of this in many ways, is sure. that people like Einstein and Bohr and others, a lot of what they came up with were just through thought experiments and that they really didn't have the technology at that time to physically prove a lot of what they had said. I, and I think that says a lot about their genius. Absolutely. Um, when you take a look at Einstein in 1905, which was his, uh, Annus Mirabilis, his miracle year where he published in 12 months, four different papers uh, on physics that turned the world of physics upside down, um, basically looking at uh, quantum theory, looking at the special theory of relativity, actually devising the formula E equals MC squared, um, equating energy and matter. These are things that he did uh, in a theoretical physics sense. His uh, his experimentation was not in uh, real life experiments as you described, but thought experiments, things that he as a genius could think about in his own mind, how could matter behave and how could energy behave in different manners. And what he did in these four papers was he, rather than proved any of his concept, he the concepts he proposed them. He basically said, well, this is what I propose to be a new theory related to how energy and matter can interrelate with each other. And, and he said in a couple of his papers, specifically, he said, and I leave it to the experimental physicist who's uh, brave enough and insightful enough to put together experiments to prove my theories. So um, this use of thought experiments was something that Einstein brought to the, uh, the table that others really followed as time went on. When you talk about Niels Bohr and others, certainly thought experiments were part of how they viewed understanding the universe. And the key to thought experiments is that they must be proven over time. So Einstein's greatest thought experiment related to the general theory of relativity, which basically said that there was a fourth dimension in the world. Everyone thought of the world in three dimensions and he thought of it in a fourth dimension. And that dimension was called space-time. It, it was a space-time dimension that basically could be proven in an experiment that he basically told uh, others to go search for, and that was to understand that in the world of uh, general uh, relativity, you would be able to see that large bodies in space, like the sun, had a, uh, an effect on everything else around that large body that basically uh, caused uh, a gravitational pull around it. But it wasn't gravity as viewed um, in a, a classical Newtonian sense of one body being attracted to another. It was more like taking a look at a, a sheet that was held taut. And if you placed a, a large body uh, like the sun on that sheet, it would cause a depression or a curvature. And everything else around that large body would move towards that curvature and be gravitating, if you will, towards it. And he even went so far as to say, so light will gravitate and be bent towards that large body. And so the way to prove that was during a total eclipse, if you got a picture at just the right time, in just the right place where you could see light around the periphery of the sun being bent at a certain angle, you could compare that to how light should have shown if there uh, wasn't this uh, gravitational effect. 
And so that's exactly what happened in 1919. Um, Arthur Eddington, a famous astronomer, took pictures of the sun during a solar, a, a solar eclipse and showed that light was bent at a certain angle that Einstein had calculated but had never proven. So these thought experiments, very interesting, but unless they were proven with quantitative data that could be reproduced over time, all they were was a hypothesis searching for an answer. Once you could prove this through a use of scientific methods to say, here's the data that's reproducible to show that this effect actually happens, then you've got a theory that you can hang your hat on. And that's exactly what these great scientists did with their thought experiments. They had experimental physicists, astronomers, and other individuals prove out their theories. And now, a brief word from our sponsors. Albert Einstein is, uh, he's a, I mean, he's a unique character in uh, the history period. But what I find found so unique about him is that he did not have a traditional education and career path into theoretical physics. That's what made right. he set his, uh, his path to becoming the, one of the, the greatest physicists of all time, probably the greatest physicist. What separated him from maybe some of his contemporaries as far as education and how he got into that um, world of theoretical physics? Yes, he, he took a different path. Um, and it was because his mind was so uh, attuned to other things than a classically trained theoretical physicist. From an early age, he described the way he thought as being in pictures rather than in words or in formulas. Um, he viewed things differently. His teachers really didn't understand someone who was um, thinking along these lines and, and basically disregarded him in uh, his lower grades of education. Through high school, he actually dropped out of high school before completing it. He decided to go to a, uh, a polytechnic institute in uh, Zurich to get a, um, a degree in scientific teaching. He, he wanted to be a, an educator um, with a scientific background. Uh, at that time, he, he met his first wife, um, Maleva Maric, and um, they were both uh, in the same physics curriculum. And uh, they shared the ability to think in the same manner, these thought experiments, the types of things that, that we just talked about. And Einstein was very much uh, involved in thinking out uh, ways of proving or understanding phenomena that couldn't be explained. Um, and this uh, light as a, uh, as a, discrete particles of energy as well as existing as a wave was one of the first things that he tackled and thought through to uh, come out with this, uh, this idea of, of quantum theory that basically supported something that Max Planck had proposed uh, five years earlier, but that no one really had experimentally proved. And um, once Einstein came out with uh, his theories supporting that, other evidence started to gather from people like Walter Nernst and others. And finally, it was proven in the 1915-1916 uh, timeframe that indeed special relativity um, and quantum theory, those were concepts that were, uh, were, were viable. But the idea that Einstein um, basically was trained as a, as a teacher rather than um, as a theoretical physicist led him to uh, his first uh, jobs were not uh, actually in uh, colleges and universities as a professor, but he was a, a patent examiner. Um, it was the only job he could get at the time. Um, it was a, a great one for him because it allowed him to use his thoughts to understand um, patents of uh, mechanical and electronic and magnetic inventions that were coming across the the patent, his patent desk um, in Bern, Switzerland. And um, he quite enjoyed using 
his mind to be able to uh, to take a look at the flaws and the positives in these patents and approve or deny them. But he his mind was such that he could get that work done in a couple of, of hours and spend the rest of the day working on his own thoughts related to physics and understanding the universe. So for a number of years, um, four or five years, he, he actually enjoyed doing that, but then moved on to become a professor of, uh, first an associate professor of physics, and then a full professor, and then finally uh, moving to Berlin um, in the 1914, 1915 timeframe and coming up with the general theory of relativity. So it, a different path, I think, than uh, as you describe others uh, classically would have taken in physics. How does somebody like that get noticed in a field like physics? I have to imagine there's a certain amount, especially in those times where many of the uh, the leaders in the academe were both highly educated and even literally aristocrats. How did somebody like Einstein, who had a great theory, get noticed by yes. these big names? And is that something that might happen today, or is that even is that locked out even more so now? That, that's interesting. Um, the way Einstein got noticed was was twofold. One, his publishing of his papers in uh, 1905 put him on the radar screen of um, physicists who were German speaking. The reason I put it that way is um, these papers were published in a German physics journal and um, Max Planck, who had first thought of uh, quantum theory in 1900, was one of the editors of um, this particular journal. And it came to his attention that Einstein was coming out with theories that not only supported his, but other theories as well. And he was quite interested in understanding more. But the big step that took Einstein from a notice from the German speaking population through this um, uh, German publication, uh, physics journal to a, a greater uh, audience was the Salve Conference in 1911. Um, five physicists from France, including Marie Curie, attended the conference. They knew little of Einstein. And because Einstein had been published in German, if you didn't speak German, you weren't, um, and couldn't read German, you weren't up to date on what Einstein was thinking. But at that conference, you could hear more about his thinking in person. There were only 24 people there. Four of them were, were from uh, France. Uh, a couple of them were from England. A few were from uh, Austria-Hungary and Denmark. And, and in addition to uh, the Germans that were there, they were the largest represented uh, population in this, this elite group of 24, Einstein was exposed to a wide range of people who might not have seen and understood his ideas. Um, fortunately, at the conference, you have French speakers, German speakers, English um, speakers who don't necessarily know the other's languages, but the moderator of the conference was chosen very carefully, very well-known uh, physicist named Heinrich Lorentz. And Lorentz was multilingual, and he was chosen um, to be the facilitator, the moderator of this conference, um, in large part because he could easily translate what was going on. If people didn't understand what someone was saying in German, he could quickly, in French and English, give them a synopsis. But not only could he translate, his mind was very astute in physics, and he understood almost all of these concepts um, and, and was able to explain them um, as he was translating. And so uh, having uh, a moderator who uh, could help people over the rough spots, if you will, would allow a, a full understanding of what an individual might be saying or, or uh, things that he might be listing on a, a blackboard or uh, that uh, explaining his, uh, his theories. And so um, this group was able to understand Einstein and understand the way he thought. They all marveled at um, his brilliance. And in fact, shortly after, Marie Curie 
um, who really didn't know Einstein until the conference, uh, a month or two later, she wrote a, a glowing recommendation for him uh, as he was applying to become a full professor at a um, uh, university in, in Zurich. Uh, and that recommendation was based on her meeting him and understanding his uh, thinking uh, at the Salve Conference. So the, the Salve Conference was, uh, I term it, his debutante ball, his, uh, his showing to a larger population than just the German speaking physics world. And that really turned his trajectory from a steady uh, increase and a steady acceleration. It, it accelerated it dramatically over the course of the next couple of years. He moved from being an associate professor in uh, Prague to Zurich and then to Berlin. And um, this was all facilitated because he was exposed to a larger population. Now, would that happen today? Um, I, I don't think um, there's the, the type of uh, silo that had been put up in the physics world um, nationalistically, or as much of a silo. What I'm talking about here is each country seemed to be siloed off in the early 1900s because of language barriers, because of nationalistic pride related to uh, Germany and their work on physics versus France and their work versus England and their work. I think there's a much more international community which allows for um, interplay and interchange of ideas uh, that wasn't necessarily in place in the early 1900s. So I think uh, individuals who are in the scientific community around the world share much more information and know much more about what each other is doing. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's important. But I, I still think that um, there aren't the type, with the exception of the Salve uh, conferences that still uh, go on to this day, there aren't that many types of conferences that allow for the intimate interaction of a small group of individuals, um, which I think assisted Einstein uh, in uh, becoming the uh, well-known personality in the physics world that he became in short order. Wow, yeah, that is something really special with that conference. An, a person who you've mentioned a few times before and who was a major component of this whole story of the Salve Conferences is Marie Curie. And I think people probably have at least a few key words attached to her, like radium and radiation. Can you tell us a little bit more about Marie Curie and what maybe her life was up to these conferences? What kind of put her on the map? Marie Curie was um, from Poland. She was uh, an industrious and inquisitive and extremely intelligent individual who couldn't get a college education uh, in Poland. Uh, the Russian uh, occupiers of Poland at the time didn't allow uh, women to get a university education. She was able to do that by leaving Poland and going to uh, the Sorbonne in Paris. And um, she became uh, both a physicist and a mathematician. She got master's degrees in both. And when she wanted to take a look at becoming a PhD in physics, um, she was looking at different uh, subjects to study. And uh, Becquerel and his unique emanations of uranium were uh, the types of things that interested her significantly. In between getting her master's degrees and doing this work on, on uranium, she met and married Pierre Curie, who was in and of uh, his own right, uh, a well-known but rather reclusive uh, physicist in, in Paris. And they formed a, a team that was um, really at, at the highest level of intellect, but they also shared um, a love of science that few really expressed at, uh, at that level in terms of living their life for science. 
they both shared that thought and it brought them even closer together. And they were um, a couple that really uh, were soulmates. Uh, I term them life partners, if you will, who supported each other and each other's work. And they worked on uh, these uh, uranium rays and then uh, understanding uh, them such that they could discover other elements, uh, polonium, radium, and uh, she basically coined the term radioactivity. And for all this work that they put, put in, both Marie individually and her husband, Pierre, uh, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in, uh, in 1903. Um, this was uh, a tremendous award and many people in the physics community and the scientific community at large thought that it must be due to Pierre Curie's brilliance and that Marie was uh, certainly helpful, but that a, a man must be leading this investigation and this discovery and this understanding because men at the turn of the century and before were just thought to be superior to women. The the whole misogynistic view of women as second class and everything that they did wasn't limited to uh, um, certain facets of society. It certainly permeated uh, culture as a whole. And Marie Curie was always fighting um, this misogynistic view that women were not the equal to men in scientific pursuits and scientific thought. But uh, they were both awarded, uh, along with Henri Becquerel, uh, the Nobel Prize, and were moving in a direction, the two of them, that continued to do research and continued to be uh, known for uh, their work in radioactivity. Her, uh, her husband, Marie Curie's husband, died a few years later in 1906 in a horrific uh, a uh, horse cart accident where he was run over, his skull was crushed and um, he died instantly. And she, for a number of years, had a difficult time moving on with her life. They had had two daughters together who really were the, the light of her life. And especially at that time, that and her work um, in, in radioactivity uh, helped her move on and adjust. But uh, she also found in uh, those years, um, 1906 to 1910, um, she found a uh, shoulder to cry on, if you will, with um, a fellow French scientist named Paul Langvin. And after a while, in 1909, 1910, she and Paul uh, uh, commenced uh, an affair. And I say commenced an affair because he was a married man with four children, but he was unhappily married. Um, he wanted to get out of his marriage, but he wasn't strong enough to take that final step to move forward. And they had a, uh, a couple of year romance that was actually exposed when she and Paul were at the 1911 Salve conference. Um, it was a the end of the conference, and it was a shocking revelation to Europe and really the world. Um, basically, Paul Langvin's wife had discovered some love letters and had published uh, some of them to try to shame them into uh, ending the affair and having Paul Langvin come back uh, with her. That's exactly what happened. Um, and unfortunately, um, for Marie Curie, her final chance at love was dashed by this uh, exposure of the affair. But here was a, a scientist, Marie Curie, who was well known and respected, who was basically uh, degraded in the press. The conservative French press uh, took her to task for being the mistress of a married man and for that to be exhibited for all to see. Um, Paul Langvin was not castigated nearly to the extent that um, Marie Curie was, and it's because she was a woman. And of course, uh, a difficult situation arose. They couldn't go on. 
and um, they ended up uh, parting ways. They remain friends for the rest of their lives, but um, never could overcome this obstacle uh, by the uh, created by the the French press and its um, merciless uh, pursuit of uh, a, a misogynistic type approach to this relationship. Marie Curie, if I'm not mistaken, did she she won another Nobel Prize? Yes, and and in fact. At the 1911 Salve Conference, she received a special delivery telegram that told her she was going to win a second Nobel Prize, this one in chemistry to bookend her her, uh, win in physics in 1903. So she alone, not with Pierre or anyone else, was to receive the uh, Nobel Prize in 1911. And um, in the middle of December, she went to Stockholm Uh, which is where the Nobel Prize in Physics and Chemistry was awarded. And she was given by the King of Sweden um, the Nobel Prize, a uh, a certificate along with that, and uh, a hefty sum of of money uh, related to winning uh, the Nobel Prize in 1911. This time, not for the uh, discovery of radioactivity, which was the prize in physics in 1903, but for the discovery of two new elements, polonium and radium, and the physical isolation of those elements um, from uh, residues, and uh, uh, which was a, a laborious and a difficult process, but she was able to do it. So here was um, the first person to ever win two Nobel Prizes. Um, and she did it in the space of less than 10 years. And so uh, you can see that uh, society awarded her for, uh, for the work, or, or the physics society and the chemical society did, awarded her for the work that she rightly um, was uh, awarded for. But at the same time, she was pilloried on a cultural sense for being a woman who was usurping Uh, her role by trying to take a uh, married man away from his family. And now, a brief word from our sponsors. If I'm not mistaken as well, didn't um, Pierre and Marie's daughter win a Nobel Prize as well? Yes. um, (laughs) The the family's legacy is is, um, so scientific in nature. Um, Her daughter, their daughter, Pierre and and Marie Curie's daughter, Irene, um, she was a uh, physicist like her mother, and she worked with her mother on radioactivity. In fact, um, she received in 1935 uh, an award, a Nobel Prize uh, award in physics with her husband, um, shades of uh, Pierre and Marie, uh, for uh, studies on artificial radioactivity. And that was what you'd say would be the fourth um, Nobel Prize that was won uh, by the Curie family. If you count uh, uh, both Pierre and Marie winning in 1903, Marie winning in 1911, and now Irene winning in uh, 1935. So four four Nobel Prizes. And in fact, um, Marie's other daughter, Eve, um, who was not a scientist. She actually was brilliant in the arts rather than in the sciences. She was a journalist and a novelist and and, uh, was well-respected in those areas. She ended up marrying um, an individual who uh, was the head of uh, the United Nations UNICEF program in the 1950s and early 60s. And she joined with him to receive uh, the Nobel Prize humanitarian prize for their work with children. So there's a fifth Nobel Prize associated with the uh, Curie family, which by far and away is the most that any family has ever won and and, uh, odds are is the most that any family ever will win. Um, But here are five awards given to a family. Um, And uh, the other interesting part of the scientific legacy is Irene, who with her husband won an award in 1935. She had a daughter and that daughter, Elaine, ended up marrying 
the grandson of Paul Langvin, who was, Paul Langvin was the one that Marie Curie had an affair with in 1910, 11, and that affair was exposed and their relationship was, uh, was severed. But here the grandchildren got married. So they completed what Marie and, and uh, Paul couldn't, which was um, the uh, joining of the two families. They, both grandchildren were uh, nuclear physicists and they produced a son who is now an astrophysicist. So um, as you can see, science lives in their, uh, in their family. It sure does. Yeah. What um, relationship was there between Einstein and Curie? Did they interact and did anything come scientifically from any interactions that they had? They, they interacted, but not on a scientific basis. It was more on a personal basis and personal support for each other. I mentioned that a few months after um, the 1911 conference, Einstein was applying for a job. He received this glowing recommendation from um, Marie Curie, and that helped for him to get um, this uh, university position at the Polytechnic University in Zurich. More interesting at that time, a month after the conference, when the exposure of the affair between uh, Paul Langvin and Marie Curie was at its height, and uh, Marie was receiving uh, just terrible press in France, Einstein decided, after knowing her for all of a month, to write her a letter. And his letter was basically that of a staunch friend and supporter. The letter basically said, don't pay any attention to what's going on in the press. Be true to your, your own values. You're above this. You don't need to listen to this. Leave this hogwash, he said, to the reptiles for which it was printed. He basically said, dismiss all of this. You're better than this. And that was just what Marie Curie needed at that point in time, to, to have a, a friend support her in an unwavering fashion. And it was that type of support that these two uh, gave to each other through the years. Um, a year and a half later, um, Marie and uh, her two daughters met with uh, Einstein and his older son. They all liked to hike um, in, in the mountains and they took a hike in the Swiss Alps and um, they had a wonderful time. And it wasn't um, because they were talking science, although they did a little bit of that. Um, it was because on a personal level, they could interact and, and understand each other and be supportive of each other. Now, um, granted, Marie Curie had such a mind that Albert Einstein could say, uh, and he did, as they're walking along a mountain trail, um, gee, I'm thinking about this type of thought experiment. And Marie Curie could not only understand it, but because of her brilliant mind, she could give thoughts herself. But the idea that Marie Curie and Albert Einstein shared in each other's scientific work really wasn't so. What they did um, was share supportive thoughts to each other about what each was trying to accomplish and personal support um, being the most important. They, uh, after World War I, were both on a, a committee to uh, restore intellectual uh, internationalism to the world. Um, basically, the League of Nations had put together a committee that was trying to help scientists and people in the arts mend the fractured relationships they had and, and establish a a reconnection so that sharing of ideas would cross national borders and, and be more an international type of community. And they worked on that together and um, were uh, moderately successful in making that happen. But again, working on things from a personal basis, not a scientific basis, was their connection. From th these two stories, the Marie Curie and her relationship with uh, Pierre Curie, and then her uh, relationship with Paul Langevin, and then 
Einstein with his wife. Which one of those two do you think might translate better towards a big screen uh, or some sort of film media? Because I think that each one of those stories has so many interesting aspects of the science and that they had such, I guess, complex and really realistic personal lives. Yes. Um, It's an interesting question. I, I like to think that one movie can't cover everything that would be uh, appropriate here just in those three relationships or pairings that you you mentioned um my thought is something along the line lines of a mini series you know something that goes for oh four five six episodes um you can stream it or potentially it might be an event mini series you know you have to wait once a week to see the next installment But the idea of these three pairings and how they interacted and the the similarities and more important, the differences um, are are things that could be explored in a dramatic fashion. Um, I I think um, a movie, an hour and a half, two hours, isn't enough. I I think um, having movie sequels is too much. And so I, I think maybe uh, a, a, a miniseries type of approach um, with installments of episodes uh, might be the best way to, to handle something like this. And don't forget, there's a, an aspect here that relates to Salve. There's an aspect that relates to all the other um, scientists that we've talked about here that could be explored in, in an episode um, that centers all of this centering around uh, the 1911 Salve Conference is the time when, when these great minds got together to debate and to discuss and to try to understand how to move forward with this wonderful uh, quantum um, perplexity versus classic physics. Why do you think that Marie Curie isn't quite the household name today that Einstein is. Yeah, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because most people don't think of Marie Curie's brilliance as much as Marie Curie's death from radiation and exposure to radioactivity, that type of thing. I think to a large extent, um, misogyny still reigns um, not in society as much as in maybe some of the scientific circles that allow publicity of individual accomplishments to reach their, their, full, um, their full exposure. But the other thing that really lends itself to um, Einstein being so popular was his very nature. He was a jovial individual more than a workaholic. He was a a person who liked to be with people versus someone like Marie Curie, who was fanatical in her work, who was extremely intelligent, but who shunned the spotlight and being in front of large groups and um, that type of thing. And so I think to a certain extent, each individual shaped his or her own exposure to the world and then the world's understanding of that that individual. More introverted um, Marie Curie is seen um, in a lesser light, if you will, I think because of that to a certain extent. Um, She certainly is seen as the premier scientific individual from a female standpoint, but Einstein overshadows all related to his being synonymous with brilliance. And um, that sort of puts her in a, uh, a second place, if you will, or, or maybe in the shadows of uh, his willingness to be out in the public and uh, enjoying that type of role. That's a, that's a great 
story in itself. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today, Jeffrey. If people want to learn more, connect with you and uh, find out where to get your uh, great book, where can they look? I think the key here is um, July 6th, the book is being published and uh, it's available on Amazon and it's available in Barnes and Noble and uh, Walmart and uh, Target and you you name it. It's going to come out both in print and as an audio book. It'll be available as ebook as well. And um, I, I think uh, I'm not a, um, a social media person per se, but I do have a, a, a logged in a LinkedIn presence um, that uh, certainly is available for uh, any sort of contact. But for me, my hope is that people listen to the audiobook, buy the book in print, um, get a copy, get a, a, an ebook download, and and take a look at a story that is um, not as much scientific in nature as it is related to history and people and their personal interactions. Science plays a part, but this isn't a science text. It's a, a text about history and the people that make history what it is. Thank you again for listening to Beyond the Big Screen. Of course, a big thanks goes out to Jeffrey Orens, author of Soul of Genius. Links to learn more about Jeffrey and his book can be found in the show notes. A great way to support Beyond the Big Screen is to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. These ratings and reviews really help me know what you think about the show and help others learn about Beyond the Big Screen. Speaking of social media, you can connect with me and other people who want to learn more about the movies they watch on Facebook and Twitter by searching for A2Z History. You can contact me there or just send a good old-fashioned email to steve at a2zhistorypage.com. Links to all of this and more can be found at a2zhistorypage.com or beyondthebigscreen.com. I will see you next time, Beyond the Big Screen.